Hi, and welcome to From the Research Chair, episode 11. I am Jason Voss, and that is my partner in ill repute, if you missed the intro. Michael Falk. Michael Falk, partner in ill repute. Today, we're going to be talking about the value versus growth dichotomy. And uh, we've got some new faces, fresh faces on the podcast today. So I'm guessing this is either a sore spot or at least something interesting to folks. Uh, Michael, I know you uh, were especially excited about this. Tell us why. Well, you know, when I grew up, I was taught that value was simply the price someone was willing to pay. And this industry has turned it into something different. Something with fancy math and assumptions and maybe projections or forecasts or liquidation or, or, or. And I really think we need to go back to my childhood. I had hair. Uh, value is the price someone is willing to pay. Shall we start there? So in other words, value is a subjective thing, not an objective thing. Yes. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. So I, you know, I think this conversation is fascinating because I think our industry has evolved somewhat unconsciously. It, it was chugging along pretty well. And we got to this point where... Well, hold on. Give us a year range. When was it chugging along pretty well? Yeah, mid-90s. Mid-90s. I'm talking about for, for active managers. Wow. They dominated AUM, AUM growth where there was a pretty good chance that if you were a pretty disciplined value manager, you delivered pretty good results. And I think that's an interesting place to start. With your permission, Michael, should we sort of review just briefly where, where the distinction value versus growth came from? Sure, are you, Chase, but are you, are you saying that that was the last time that active value managers actually performed in the 1990s? I would say it was the last time there was low or giraffe level fruit in that strategy. Ah, okay. All right. So let's go there. Yeah. yeah. So, so should I, should I assign blame? No, 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 no. We don't, let's, we don't blame on this podcast. How about I actually make a citation? Make a citation. Morningstar was born in the 1980s. Morningstar started to gain traction in the late eighties, early nineties. Morningstar built a style box with an intention I believe it was a positive intention with an intention to help explain what was going on with investment management so that people who may be purchasing it had a better understanding of what they were buying. I think it was started as an educational tool. And what we know is it was based upon research that everybody knows, but they've maybe forgot Fama and French. What they did was they took the S&P 500 and they made sure it was the center of their box. And of course, since it was larger companies, it was large cap. So everything in that box became relative to the S&P 500 like that. Over time, the box, which began as an educational tool, became a descriptive tool for how people should manage money because some investors thought they needed to fill in X number of boxes to be properly diversified. Eh, wrong answer. That doesn't work. That's not diversification. Stocks with other stocks. There's a limit to how well that works. So I think what started with great intentions as an educational tool became something much less so. Ooh. Jason, over to you. Yeah, we're building a, a conversational structure here. Let me add to that framing, maybe some brickwork. The modern portfolio theory, what's the right word? The ideas, the pillars of it were put up in the 1970s by Sharp and Lippmann, and they started to be tested. And basically, from the very beginning, MPT didn't hold water. People found anomalies all over the place. And one of the anomalies that was found by Eugene Fama and Ken French uh, was, in fact, that uh, if you bought high book to market, they didn't do price to book, they did book to market, 
So if you bought high book to market, you could earn outsized returns and persistently, which that anomaly basically said the prediction of modern portfolio, portfolio theory was probably wrong. Not only that, but the efficient market hypothesis, which is one of those pillars of MPT was also probably wrong. And in 1992 in Chicago, where Michael and Jeremy are, uh, an interesting thing happened. I've actually traced the research for for Return of the Active Manager, the book I co-authored that came out last Jason's year. Jason's like an investment archaeologist. I do like to excavate and go to primary sources, brother. No doubt. Uh, but in any case, in 1992, Fama and French, they had a little conference that they were doing in Chicago each year. And it was kind of a, a mecca for investors. And they basically published the small cap effect as well as the value effect and acknowledged that they were real in about, I think, April, May, 92. Coincidence or not, also in Chicago, Morningstar, two months later, put out the style box. And to Michael's point, it was meant to be a descriptive thing, which was saying, hey, if we acknowledge that these are two anomalies in MPT, those are the two ways that people must be adding incremental value as investment managers. And so we want to be able to describe for people trying to evaluate the quality of these managers, how is it they're actually adding value? Not value like is in valuation, but value is in alpha. What's interesting, and to Michael's point, that which was descriptive actually has become prescriptive. They're no longer describers of performance after the fact. They're navigational compass points ahead of time. And of course, they're the dreaded measures of style drift and uh, tracking error, which sort of enforce uh, the style box. And so... I think, Michael, you and I believe that value versus growth is probably a false dichotomy. I'll make one final point, and then I'll turn it back over to you. We could reject the style box as an idea, if nothing less, for the following very simple observation. Both axes on the style box include the market and fluctuations in the market. And not only that, but the market is not something any one investment manager can manage. So if you are a small cap value manager doing your job well, your portfolio, even with zero turnover, ought to drift up and to the right if you're doing your job well, having nothing to do with any decision you have made. So if you buy a great business, the equity of a great business, let's make this real. It's not just a piece of paper. You're buying a share in a real business. It's a small company. And you know, let's say it's underpriced compared to the market. And you pick a winner. It gets bigger. It gets more expensive. It gets bigger. It gets more expensive. Lo and behold, you are brilliant with your security analysis and your selection. And you had to sell it long ago because if you didn't, the person who hired you might fire you because you did great work, but you're no longer small cap value. Now you're mid cap core or you're maybe even large cap growth if you never sold. So I said earlier that our industry sort of arrived at this moment where value is really struggling, active management's really struggling. I said it was, we arrived here unconsciously at that early junction, 1992. And I say junction because there's sort of a, in my estimation, the history of uh, investment management at the professional level, at the scaled level, at the public level, that's an inflection point, 1992. And at that moment, we had been charging as revenue a percentage of assets under management. And at that moment, we didn't realize that that ultimately would be one of the things that would really hurt us. And here's why. One, uh, a lot of MBAs evaluate the performance of investment management. MBAs are taught to evaluate data. And guess what is for certain? Your expenses. Guess what is not for certain? Your returns. And so they began to hammer on the expense ratio. And by the way, I would argue that if we had it to do over again, we would not uh, build business models like this because that's a commodity pricing model. It basically says the only thing I need to know about an asset manager is how much money they manage, not how well they perform. We're a luxury good folks as active managers. We're not a commodity, but we've got the wrong pricing model. We've got a commodity pricing model for what is ultimately luxury good. Michael, you've you're triggered a memory. I, 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 oh, I wish I had the citation in my head right now. A few years back, they uh, surveyed some MBA finance students. I believe it was at Harvard. 
And they gave them a, an assortment of index funds to choose from with an assortment of expense ratios. And they asked them, MBA finance students, which one they preferred. And you know what the results were. They didn't unanimously pick the cheapest index fund. They actually, many of them picked the more expensively priced index funds. They were using the price as a signal of quality. I'm sorry, it's an index fund. By the way, we're not talking smart beta here, folks. We're talking about plain vanilla S&P 500 index funds that were used. And other than naming the university, if my memory is correct, we will name nobody else to protect the non-innocent. So yeah, I, Michael, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. I, my MBA uh, career, as well as subsequently, it's uh, not untoward to hear people say, you can only manage what can be measured, right? And so expense ratios can be measured. Your ultimate returns, your expected returns are a guess. We're talking about a probabilistic estimation as opposed to a for certain thing. Most MBAs are taught to manage expenses pretty well, and they have a hard time, say, with marketing efforts because they always ask themselves, well, how do we know that it's going to succeed? Marketing's results tend to be indirect rather than direct. We put the marketing effort out there. We market every quarter. We don't know necessarily what it's doing for our top line, but we do it anyway, and it's on faith. And so I think the predisposition, because most of us are quantitative and those who evaluate us certainly are, they love to look at the expenses. And I think we've but got- But it must the, have been a trick question. So higher expenses must mean higher expected performance. The, 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 the big brains, well, MBA finance, Ivy League, all right. Listen, they were building a story in their head of value, haha, pun intended, that this must be better because it's charging more money. But let's go back to the box for a second, back to the Morningstar box. Folks, Morningstar box is supposed to be descriptive of the fundamentals of an underlying business, right? Simple, I don't think anybody would argue that. But yet Morningstar will take a momentum growth manager and put them on the far right side of the box. I'm sorry, momentum managers don't care a lick about fundamentals. Let me say this a different way. I have had the pleasure of meeting and working with a lot of managers over the years, value, growth, and everything in between. And what I can tell you is I've never met a single manager that likes to overpay for the securities they buy. I've never met this person. I don't think this person exists. So, they all care about valuation. And here's my estimation of the big difference between these people that Morningstar is trying to label. One wants a cheap valuation based upon what they know today, book, what they can touch or try and put their hands on, what they think they know today. The opposite end, growth, managers. They want a cheap valuation based upon what they think is going to happen tomorrow. Not what they can put their hands on today, but what they believe is going to happen tomorrow. So everybody wants an inexpensive or cheap valuation. One manager is more focused on what they think they know about today. Another manager is more focused on what they think they know about tomorrow. Folks, it's valuation and time estimation. Michael, that's it. to me, that's pure wisdom. And I agree with you. When I was at CFA Institute, I wrote a piece saying the big distinction between value and growth was not an emphasis on valuation. It was a difference in time horizon. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, as you can tell- so, so the box covers fundamentals. And then what we need to do is we need to say there's a valuation continuum Okay. But before Keep. you go there, before you go there, let me finish. Well, I just want to put the momentum managers in their place. Oh, but see, I didn't want to go to momentum quite yet. All right. Well, then you go. Yeah. What I was going to say is, <laughs> as a value manager, if you don't care about growth, you're essentially saying you're a bond investor, right? <gasps> Baked into your valuation model is a growth estimate. If there is no growth estimate, then you're basically discounting fixed cash flows, and why not just be a fixed income investor? Oh, no yields. Ooh. Or calculate the duration of estimated growth. 
Oh my goodness. Ooh, Ooh tricky. Um, and if you're a growth manager to Michael's point, you actually care about valuation, but the value you care about is you don't want to overpay for your guess as to what growth is going to be in the future. Yes, invest professional investors don't guess, Jason. They make forecasts. Yes. So here's the detour I wanted to make before summarizing and agreeing with you. Uh, peg ratios. Uh, that I hate peg ratios. I'm going to insert parents. He does, folks. He's not kidding. He, he really does hate peg ratios as much as I hate tracking error. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, yeah, the peg ratios can actually, you could test them mathematically, which I did. I did a journal of private equity uh, article like 10 years ago. And I looked at the math of it. And the reason I hate peg ratios is if the PE is significantly higher than the growth rate, like say, like it, the general rule of thumb is if the peg is one or less, you buy. But if it's 1.3, the growth rate actually has to accelerate and grow much faster than 30% faster than the P part. So in other words, it's not uh, like linear, the relationship growth has to go like this, and the higher you overpay based on PE, the much, 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 much faster does the growth rate have to be. And I don't think that's well understood that the relationship is not a linear one, but it's an exponential one. Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Michael, you've uh, sort of said what we believe the real distinction is. There aren't value versus growth investors. There are fundamental investors versus Michael. Momentum investors momentum investors in one some line people on care about the business some people care about the price movement totally. these are not the same thing and lest we get real pompous about it as fundamental investors of which michael and i both i think count ourselves oh, no, no 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 i'm not discriminatory i like fundamentals and momentum what i was going to say is i am fond of saying that the way to make money as an investor is to identify skills that support your consciousness, that exalt your consciousness. If you do that, then you'll probably make money. If the way you understand the universe and the mental models that you've constructed that work for you and activate your, ex, uh, your expertise is a momentum investor, go do it. The market doesn't care how you invest or why you invest. What it cares about is whether you made money or not. Well, you almost sound like a guy from Shark Tank right now. All I care about is making money. As constrained by ethics, of course, my friend. Well, of course, of course. That goes without saying, but it should be said anyway. The, you know, it's so interesting here. Uh, with work that Jason and I do with investment teams, we'll ask them to present their thesis, why they want to buy the security. All right, seems reasonable enough. All right, what do you think you're going to earn Right? What is your estimated rate of return if your thesis plays out? So that's the why. Why are you buying this in the first place? Well, because I think I can make X dollars. Number two, how? The how is what's the catalyst? How is the rest of the world going to come to recognize your brilliance? Because you can't make money unless somebody comes in behind you, essentially, and buys what you already own. And time and time again, Jason, do we not hear, okay, the why and the thesis, we got that. We have no idea what the catalyst is going to be. We don't have a view on that. We hear it all the time. Not only that, if they do have a catalyst, and some do, they don't have a time horizon baked in there. They don't necessarily, or there's disagreement on an investment team or an investment committee as to when the catalyst is going to occur. And there are disagreements and misunderstandings that naturally fall from both of those problems. Yeah, and this is where good money goes to die, otherwise known as dead money in your portfolio. You bought this possibly exciting thesis. You maybe had a concept, an idea about the catalyst, but you don't say when. So it continues to take up space in the portfolio because it doesn't much, ever do much. So it doesn't annoy people. It doesn't get them excited. And it just takes up valuable real estate in the portfolio. Bad. Definitely bad. Uh, so Michael, we've basically covered parts one and two, at least what we promised people to cover. Part three was other ways of possibly solving this problem. Um, before we do that, though, I know you and I, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please interrupt me and say, no, that's not what I believe, or say, attaboy. Uh, Michael and I both believe, or at least I think we believe, that the industry is heading toward fundamental investors that are not 
do not allow themselves to be pigeonholed by a style box. What they recognize is that their real value add is assessing businesses well, and said another way, the quality of the business, the quality of the opportunity, and the valuation part is a portion of the work. Defining the pond is probably where the real value add is. I'm, I'm gonna give you an aspirational attaboy. And, and Jason, the reason I do that is, you know, we hear so often from managers that we work with, teams we work with, that they say, well, what if we change that, what are our clients going to think? And to which we retort, so if your performance goes up because you evolve your, your process, your clients are going to be upset with you? Help us understand that. So what's happened is the industry has, to some extent, bought into or cemented the boxes. And now the money managers are actually buying into the same storyline instead of sticking their chest out and being proud. No, we're good investors and we're gonna make you money and we'll describe and share everything we're doing, but we're not gonna sit in a box. Because if we buy something that becomes a juggernaut successfully, we're gonna let it provide you performance. We're not going to clip its wings before it takes off for flight because we're going to start drifting in style. Michael, I think you and I both agree the bigger of the opportunities is for the boutique type firms rather than the big behemoths because they can course correct on some of this. The point you make, though, when we hear when working with investment teams, what will our clients think? We always know that we have hit an existential raw nerve with an organization. Because guess what? Inevitably, they haven't had those conversations with their clientele, but they invoked the clientele as having erected this artificial boundary. And consequently, it becomes this Rubicon that they refuse to cross. We actually challenged one of the managers we worked with earlier this year to have conversation with the marketing arm of their business to get some of the finger on the pulse intel about what clients really want and what they really ask questions about. And there is a sea change that seems to have taken place in the last 18 to 24 months where what the consultants want, what the pension funds want, what the asset owners want from managers is performance. And they are less concerned with things like tracking her than they used to be. And in fact, we've actually heard a change that many of the consultants are now saying, if your tracking error is too low, we won't hire you because we know you're not active. Yeah, yeah. Listen, they can buy index funds for next to nothing. So if they're going to use active management, they want it to be active. Huh? Shocking. So well, here, let's, go, go. Can, can, we, can we pound a couple more nails into the value, quote unquote, camp for just a second? And it's, it's not that I don't love these people. I know a lot of value investors and they're good people, but they need to evolve. Every time I see an article, a piece of research, and it's some sense of value is dead, can please somebody just define value before you pronounce it dead? Show me the body. Come on. But here's the issue. Because we're not buying little pieces of paper, we're buying really real businesses. I want to invoke Occam's razor for just a moment, but I want to add a word, Occam's capital razor. Why on earth would anybody running a business or starting a business want to make their business capital intensive? The risk, the costs. Yeah, we can talk about what's going on with the platform type companies in the world today and how they're capital light, but go back to the premise of starting a business or running a business. Why on earth would you want to engage and require more capital? So if this is a goal of business, then why and how can you depend on price to book, something of that sort anymore? That's just one point. Jason, over to you. Yeah, I th I'm feeling pretty generous today. Maybe it's because the damned election is finally behind us, seemingly behind us. Uh, I, Michael, we encounter folks that the techniques that they use, if they are value investors, have not evolved, which is your point. So yeah. here's a freebie. Here's a technique that works, borrowed from my own career. Uh, oh, and actually, half a step back, we challenge investment teams frequently. You believe that you're good at valuation? Prove it to us. And inevitably, when we pull back the Band-Aid, we learn via data 
most managers don't add value based on valuation. They miss the mark. How do we evaluate valuation? Is it predictive of future returns? Did you buy when it was low or did it go lower after you bought? How much did you miss the mark on the upside? It's huge. The real value add, and I did research along with my co-author Tom Howard for Return of the Active Manager, most of the alpha added by our teams of research analysts and PMs is in security selection. And no matter what, however you slice this and dice this, we actually are really good at identifying quality companies. We are shy at two things, portfolio management, which is a value subtracting activity, which Michael and I have talked about previously on our portfolio construction podcast. Well, only- just, just so they know what we're talking about, folks, yep. when we talk about portfolio management, we're talking about things like sizing and selling and risk management topics, diversification topics. That's what we're putting under the umbrella of portfolio management. Jason. Correct. And most of the value add is in the top 10, followed by the top 20 holdings in a portfolio. All of the holdings below 20 on average for every manager are alpha negative. Say that, I'm going to say that again because this is interesting. The narrative that has taken hold in our business is the active management does not add alpha. That is true. But all on average, every fund on average adds alpha with security selection. So that's in their tells, top in their top 20. Yeah. The other stat that I'm gonna quote that we did for return to the active manager is Michael to your point, to the MBA's point, the funds that charge or perform the best actually have a much higher expense ratio than the ones who underperform. <sighs> Because it's a luxury good. Because it's a luxury good. They know they deserve it. They earn it. Said another way, we would encourage you to have a little bit of an existential moment and think about how you're doing business and can you survive doing what you're doing. We tend to think it's going to be harder and harder to continue on with the inertia that's been in place since about the early 90s. So here's the generosity I was thinking of. Uh, I got distracted, as I frequently do. The generosity is from my own career, portfolio manager career, and I did pretty well. You can see my results on my, my website uh, and in other locations. Um, uh, and this is a freebie. I, I almost hesitate to talk about it. Michael, I'll just what, spit it out, man. I know, I know. I just, I'm trying to think of how to frame it because I don't talk about it publicly very frequently. Um, my valuation technique, and I thought I was pretty good at valuation, really good at valuation. I had data that I was good at valuation. It was predictive of future returns. I didn't emphasize one valuation technique like price to free cash flow or price to enterprise value or price to EBITDA. I valued all of them. I had seven different valuation methods and I would compare. Michael, to your point about intangibles, you didn't quite say intangibles. No, I didn't get there. I wanted to start with uh, Occam's razor, and then I was going to go to intangibles, which clearly are not a simple topic. They are not a simple topic, but if you value price to sales, price to EBIT or operating income, price to EBITDA, price to earnings, enterprise value to earnings to get rid of share buyback effects, price to book value, price to assets, price to free cash flow, price to whatever, price to dividends, if you look at all of these and you average them, it highlights the errors in your model. And if the price to book is always lower than the price that the market is willing to pay historically, then you know you've got a problem, which Michael, take it away. Talk about intangibles. Why is book value a poor measure? Oh, where to begin? All right, so the universe. The universe is comprised of matter and Dark matter or antimatter? I, we, can, we can argue this point, but here's the point. Let's, can we just think of intangibles, let's just think of it as a second, as dark matter, right? We know what we can see in the value of the business, but yet the price indicates there's something we're missing, right? Can we at least start to acknowledge if our valuation approach is showing something very, very different than the market price. Something is amiss. Can we at least go looking for it to make a decision? Is our valuation approach wrong or is there something hidden that we can't see, such as intangibles, whether it be brand, whether it be technology, whether it be human capital, whether it be environmental capital, what we can go on and on. The point is, folks, when there is a big disparity, at least take the time to ask, might there be something that we're not? 
if only because it's inconvenient before you say, ah, not buying that. Michael, I love that you brought up the multiple capitals. One of my roles, Michael, you know this, uh, I don't think too many other people know this on this call. I advise the board of integrated reporting, International Integrated Reporting Council, which makes explicit six forms of capital, financial capital, manufactured capital, uh, intellectual capital, environmental capital, social capital, and financial capital. Or, no, you said financial capital twice. I, I, always, I always forget the sixth one. I can never I'm, remember. I'm paying attention. The point is, uh, uh. As, as an investor, I was a systems thinker. And I think great fundamental investors are systems thinkers, but to only think of valuation and not to think about the environment that a firm, and not by environment, I literally mean in this green environment behind me, the context in which they operate, the customers, uh, the way they affect the governments or agitate governments, Google, Alphabet, uh, Facebook. If you don't think about all those factors, you're not being comprehensive as a fundamental investor. If you are, then it allows you to break free of, I have to buy things only that have you know, low peg ratios or low price to book or whatever. Um, one other tip, uh, a fun, you know, roll up your sleeves, fundamental investor tip. Michael, you've heard me say this before. I was a margin of safety investor. The margin of safety is an acknowledgement of, hey, I may not be valuing this right. So if you are willing to make that argument on the downside, I want to buy things cheaper, Shouldn't we also acknowledge to the upside? I don't have a very oh. good estimate of the peak value of this business too. Oh, Jason, Jason, the, the simple, beautiful logic of what you just said, absolutely nobody considers. In our practice, what we have seen, nobody is considering this. They are willing to state that the market is mispricing this security, okay? And here's why. But they are not willing to state that they are potentially mispricing <laughs> this security. And here's why. Um, overconfidence? Maybe a little. Listen, if you require a margin of safety, which on its surface is a beautiful concept, because what it says is, I'm fallible. I may make a mistake, so therefore, I want to have a margin of safety with what I buy. I love it. I'm a fan. However, that's about what can go wrong. Please, please, please just ask yourself a question in your research. What might go right? There's two halves to this distribution. And Michael, you and I both are fans of Essentia Analytics and some of the research they've basically shown that a lot of the value detraction, uh, if you're a value manager, is because you don't let what? Winners run. Your winners run. Exactly. So if you are believe you are fallible to the downside, you're probably also fallible to the upside. Uh, Michael, what other points can we bring in that we haven't so far? Actually, you know, before I ask you that, what have we left out? I think based on what you just said, let's bring up what you said at the very top because it's the most important point. What is value? The price someone is willing to pay. So if the market gets away from your valuation estimate, what does that probably indicate? Other people actually are willing to pay a higher price. Hmm. So there could be room to the upside. You could let your winners run. There could. You know, listen, I, I don't know. Why, are, are, is everybody in the investment industry, uh, you know, absent growth and momentum invest, investors, just uh, depressive personalities? Folks, things can go right, too. They just don't only have the opportunity to go wrong. Can you let yourself enjoy a win every now and then, please? Michael, I feel like I'm therapizing our listeners. Well, you know, Michael, what have we left out? I know one thing that I haven't mentioned that I would love to mention. Well, here's, here's the biggest thing that we, we, we touched on, but I just want to review again. Markets evolve. Markets change. Business communities evolve. Business communities change. Our investment processes, whether they be more about book value, more about potential future earnings growth. I don't care. 
why are we not evolving our investment processes too? I'm not talking about changing your philosophy. I'm not talking about changing the investment investor that you are. What I'm saying is at least evolve because when the community of things that you can buy starts to shrink massively because of your historical process adherence, then you have two choices, right? You can evolve your processes or you can close the firm and give your clients their money back. Because at some point, you have so little to buy, you cannot properly manage your portfolios. That is an existential choice, Jason, right? You can close your firm or you can evolve your processes, but people are hesitant to evolve their processes because they don't think their clients will allow it. Well, would your clients rather have bad performance or get their money back because you're closing the firm or you didn't and you should have? All, Michael, what you raise is an issue of identity. And you and I have talked about it before that when we're working with investment teams, one of the things besides the technical aspects we're discussing right now that, that people don't do such a good job either recognizing, evaluating, or changing toward, another thing are the behavioral aspects. And I don't mean behavioral finance. I mean, this issue right now is an issue of identity. Who are we? To come full circle, I would say that most of us are fundamental investors that are probably on this podcast today. Our real value add is in identifying high quality businesses that will perform well. Valuation might be a value add. Chances are probably not. The data show definitely not. Low probability that you're adding value. And, and just for, can we just add one thing? Sure. Right. Listen, we're not saying that people are not good at valuation as much as we're trying to communicate, it is exceptionally hard. And over time, you win from compounding returns. That's from a business growing and succeeding. That's not from the price changing. Yeah, it, it, good point. In fact, we were working with the client re recently said, well, Jason, do you not think valuation is important? I said, no, it's very important, but be sure you do it well. So check the data. If you don't do it well, be prepared to evolve your process. We've put forth a couple of examples today of how you could do that. Uh, one point that I had wanted to make, it used to be a question I would ask prospective analysts that were going to work uh, at uh, the Davis Funds where I worked, uh, that we asked was, would you prefer at the business level to grow assets under management through marketing or through performance? And to me, there's a right answer there. Um, and it takes care of some of what we're talking about. The right answer to me is through performance. Most people answer that they're indifferent. Um, and I think that's part of the problem is our business has evolved so that the marketing aspect dominates the investment portion of it rather than the marketing that supposedly the bullhorn on great performance. I would yeah, rather start with a foundation of great performance because then the marketing is so much easier. And that, yeah, that by and the way, is the, the argument to evolve the process. Yeah, and, and Jason, let me check this with you. I don't know your thought on this. I think the marketing focus is really out of fear. I don't think it's out of malintent. I think it's out of fear in that we don't know if performance is going to be good. We don't know when performance is going to be good. So we better gather assets. This is like storing food for the winter. It is, and I think that it's a lot of it is out of fear, which is why in part we see a natural rub in firms between their sales and marketing professionals and the investment team. There's a natural rub because the investment team is confident or at least pretends to be, and the marketing team is afraid to some extent. What do you make of that? I think that's exactly where the friction comes from. I think that the business and especially those who have the ability to green light a new large scale client, um, they tend to ask questions which are more marketing type questions and questions, as we said at the top of this conversation today, are invalid questions. They're not important distinctions. The style box is not the important distinction. How I manage the money from a fundamental perspective or momentum, most of the people today probably on our podcast are not momentum investors. That's the more important distinction. And then I mentioned identity earlier. Anytime you have an identity issue and it's always really hard to accept that you might be wrong because it means everything has to change. 
And so that's, I think, the bigger issue that we're talking about. What is the identity of a value investor today versus what it was 30 years ago? And I think it's really under pressure. And I think we've lost sight of what it really means. It's really about a fundamental investor. Ben Graham is a fundamental investor, not a value investor. Valuation was a part of his process. But he also emphasizes identifying great businesses, so on and so forth. And, I and, say- and, and Warren Buffett evolved Benjamin Graham's process. And he's considered one of the greatest investors of all time, and he's still considered a value investor, but he evolved the process. Hey, can we just ask if it's okay for Warren to do this? Do you think you've got clearance that you can do it yourself? Maybe you have clearance. Indeed. The other issue is because winners are not allowed to run very much as we've talked about already, the challenge, you know, marketing departments have to continually grow and refresh assets because the investment management continually clips its winners. They, they need more money, right? Because they're not taking up the same space. Let's play this game for a second. You have a consistent philosophy and process of how you manage money, all right? But you haven't evolved it. So your fishing pond is getting smaller and smaller. If you don't let winners run, you then by definition have to be accumulating cash. Do you not, Jason? That's the alternative. Or you're, you're taking that cash position and trying to be market neutral by buying your benchmarks ETF, cheap ETF, um, which is not yeah, a bad strategy. The point I had wanted to make, I didn't quite finish, uh, my apologies, is The core fundamental activity of an investment firm is to deliver returns. If you're an active manager, that has to be the root of the business. If you're afraid of losing a customer, so be it. If that means that you are performing well, so be it. Let yourself attract a better class of shareholders who grok what you're trying to do. I think too often we try to bend over backwards to retain a client when in fact we know in the long run We may retain them, but in the long run, underperformance, because we accept the handcuffs that come with that client, means we can't deliver returns. We're going to lose them anyway. Yeah, one one of my favorite stories in the industry from over the years that I heard about goes back to around 08, 09. And everybody, or most people probably know the name Seth Klarman and the Baupost Group. And what he was doing around that point, a famed value investor, by the way, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, He was picking up the phone, calling his clients and saying, now's the time, send more money. And they did. We won't talk about in recent times where that hasn't worked as well. But back then, back then, send more money. And they did because they understood his process. They trusted his process. They appreciated what he did in terms of his work. But you know what's so interesting is people had trouble with him in more recent years because they said, wait a minute, I hired you to be a value investor and manage my money. And that's what he was doing. You know what that means? That means he has to go invest where he sees value, which means that you may not always be in just stocks. You could be in all sorts of different asset classes. So if you are a real deal value investor, by definition, you must, you have to be multi-asset. Do you not, Jason? I think you do. One of the things that I used to do that was value add for my shareholders was we would evaluate the business from a fundamental investment point of view and then ask where in the capital structure we wanted to own them. And you mean the whole balance sheet? You looked at the whole balance sheet? Looked at the whole balance sheet and the whole income statement. Because wow. if I like the company's operations, but I think their CFO is not so high quality, or I think that the equity is maybe a little bit pricey, can we not buy the debt? Maybe we think that what's undervalued is the level of stability of their ability to generate earnings. And I would buy a blend of kind of a strange philosophy. I'd be both long, the fixed income and equity of the same company in a blend if I couldn't get conviction on the equity. But I like the business generally, but maybe I thought the stock was overvalued. I might buy the piece of, a piece of fixed income to hedge the downside. Anyway, yes, I think it does make that case, Michael. We ought to yeah, be and you know what? You know what else I throw at value investors just for I just want to see their reaction every now and then. So you found a business you like, but you don't like the price. Okay. I say sell a naked put. 
on what you want to own, but you want to own cheaper. And they're like, oh, that's so risky. I said, why is it risky? You're going to get revenue to be forced to buy it at a cheaper price. So you're going to lower your cost. And if it never, if it never gets there, you get the free capital from selling the naked put. If you really like the business, don't sit around and wait for it to arrive where you wish and hope it will. Take action. Michael. And boy, the reactions I get on that usually is, oh, Michael, we can't do that. Or that wouldn't pass compliance. Oh, that's not right. Or that's too risky. I thought you said you were an investor. And that is the distinction. Investor little I or investor capital I. If you're an investor capital I, don't you want optionality? I'm not saying options, optionality. Multi-geography, yeah. multi-cap, value and growth, fixed multi-asset, fixed income. Maybe a little cash. Cash, who knows? Um, I think we've come full circle. Do we want to open up for questions? We have a little bit of time. Yeah, left. let's do that. For the people who have been persistent enough to listen to us stammer on, <laughs> maybe they want to send in a question or unmute themselves. Or not. Or not. Hi, I'll ask a question. Well, thank you, Kate. Throw it at us. <laughs> So this goes back to comments you were making about having stocks that are just taking up space in the portfolio. And, and um, I've, I had a little bit of an exception to that because one, I found that sometimes it's good to have what I call legs in the portfolio. So not all stocks are moving at the same time and <clears throat> when we're not in these sort of one note markets but in more um sort of what i'm used to <laughs> um you know th uh, the markets um <clears throat> excuse me it it i found that it it helped provide a consistency of return as opposed to a more volatile volatile return and of course you can end up with with sort of dead money or dead stocks as well. But, um, you know, it also goes to, you may know what the catalyst might be, but they could also take longer than you think they're gonna take. Sure. So you don't always know exactly how long that's going to be. So I'm just curious how you react to that. Um, I think what you said is perfect, Kate. Here's my reaction. When you're gonna be buying the security, you're recommending to the team that the team buys the security the why, the how, and the when. And all, all that I suggest you do is when you get to the forecasted when, if nothing has happened, just revisit the thesis. See if you want to update the when. I'm not talking about, hey, you got to get rid of that security right then and there. But I do think that if your thesis was incorrect, time has passed, you, at that, at a minimum, you need to reassess. So Kate, I don't disagree with you at all. I just like that protection. Yeah, and my response to that question, Kate, is the following. One, I'll quote the data again. The top 20 holdings are the ones that generate return. Thereafter, they don't so much. That said, because of, in the US, diversification rules, uh, which come with the Investment Company Act of 1940, um, we do have portfolios that are larger than 20 securities. And I used to, as a PM, did exactly as you are suggesting, Kate. And I don't think it's a bad strategy. I would put in that 21st through, say, 35th holding uh, securities, which I was less certain of than I was uh, the top 20. But I tended towards a little bit more downside protection there in those holdings. And then the very back half of my portfolio, and I averaged between 35 and 45 holdings in my career, the very bottom part of the portfolio were companies that I didn't want to have hurt me. And they were very income oriented. So there were utilities in there, or I might have convertible securities in there where the yields were good. And there was a cheap equity option embedded in that convert. And so I might get some upside. And yeah, those are the th way we do portfolio composition. Um, Sadly, I have come to the realization post my investment management career that equal weight portfolios almost always outperform uh, our sizing decisions. And over the course of 10,000 or 40,000 
uh, random portfolios drawn, the equal weight almost always outperforms. And so another way of saying that, Jason, is we're good at picking securities. Yeah. But we're not good at sizing them because we don't know which one of those good picks may be a bigger winner than we expected. Exactly. So my my final comment here is evolve forward my thinking from when I was a PM, I now would go look at the data. What does the data show? Are you successful with that philosophy? And if so, continue to do it. And if not, no biggie. My comment earlier was where I usually start when I am trying to counsel about how to invest better is what do you do well? And if you do activities A, B, C, D, E well, find tools that exalt that capability, but it, confirm it with data. If you can confirm it with data, keep doing it, right? It's all about adding value and adding alpha. And if you're doing it, do it. And for people who don't know, Kate, I'm going to out you just for a second. Kate was a very successful international equity manager some time ago. So she is speaking from personal experience, not hypothetical. Kate, hats off. Any other questions? Or Kate, a follow-up. Well, we'll give somebody else a shot if they wish to dive in. Hey, listen, the water's fine. Hearing none, do we? Yeah, I, um, hi guys. Yes. I don't. Um, I don't know if I did. I, I agree with everything that you all have said. I don't know if I actually have a question as more of a confirmation point, but I. Um, it's. I, I do think that ma money managers struggle with the optics of evolving and what may come with that, right? So you can try to find this balance of not being stuck on your process, but also being consistent with what clients have hired you to do. And, and even this week, I think, is an interesting, um, interesting kind of reversal that you're seeing. Uh, Small rotation this week. Yeah, just a little bit, right? So if you, um, so, so if, you, if, if you did kind of go where what, what has been working as of late or going with what you think are really high quality companies and abandoning value, you, you possibly missed out on this rotation. But I guess from a question standpoint, how do you reconcile what you're t what you're trying, what you're recommending, thinking about from a process standpoint, finding good fundamental stories that can compound over years. But how do you kind of reconcile that with asset allocation where, you know, the, the idea is, is you want managers and holdings to zig and zag accordingly um, over a cycle. So if, if everyone is theoretically kind of having a shared pursuit of these great brands and these great companies, in the last couple of years, you, you probably have a, a pretty significant bet in your portfolio. Look at the composition of the S&P 500, for instance. So how, how, do you, how do you reconcile kind of pursuit of, of these good companies, but also uh, employing some degree of asset allocation and diversification? Well, Kevin, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the comments and question. Uh, asset allocation is a whole different expansion on the topic right, versus an actual single asset investment strategy. Then the question we're talking about, how do we leverage our overall diversification by combining differentiated strategies? That's what I'm hearing in the question. Now, that can be in a portfolio if the portfolio is multi-asset. If the portfolio is not multi-asset, then we're talking about using other managers. You know what? I think in terms of manager diversification, find what you believe are skilled fundamental managers and diversify among them and then add in a dose of index funds because there's a great deal of logic for owning some of both. I happen to have an appreciation for both. In a more typical asset allocation scheme, however, I like multi-asset at the center, active, talented multi-asset at the center of my portfolio, maybe a few of those types of people, and then I make my tactical bets with index funds. That's how it should be done. People do that absolutely backwards. My, so my response, first of all, I love that you have the rotating Penn State helmet and we were talking about rotation. <laughs> I think that's, that's brilliant. I, I was looking at the helmet at the very moment I think Michael said rotation. So that, that struck me as funny. Um, I'm, I am less sanguine than Michael about this. I, 
whenever I hear people talk asset allocation, my response usually is prove it. Um, I, I think asset allocation needs to be held to the same level of scrutiny that um, portfolio managers of mutual funds are and they're not. And my experience has been again, and the data shows that we just don't add value that way. And Michael, you and I both believe asset allocation is extraordinarily hard and it's actually harder than choosing yeah. securities. Well, and, and I'll pile on for several years now, I've been quoted in Pensions and Investments magazine. I'm very dubious about OCIOs, not because the concept doesn't make good sense, but show me an OCIO who's actually shared their performance history, who's actually showed skill with asset allocation. They don't. They almost always, at least historically, maybe times are changing. I haven't seen a few lately. They don't show performance. They're unwilling. They say, well, we customize for all of our clients. To Jason's point, the, the skill and art of asset allocation is a higher degree of difficulty than style or security specific work. And my final comment on that is the, the thing that you first said, Kevin, about the optics of the change. It's been my experience that the real thing that's going on there is not what the client thinks. It's if I go to the client, I am tacitly admitting that I was wrong. And that's the painful part. And all too often what Michael and I find is there's a lot of angst about what the client will think that's a really easy problem to solve. Ask the client, what do you think? And all too often when we say, have you asked your clients? The answer is always no, we haven't. So what and, happens- And have you backed up your changes, your evolutions? Have you backed it up with data? You did research, this is what you discovered. So you're making a slight shift. Clients don't, they like that. They're they not against like it. I began my career as one of those pension consultants and I liked it. In fact, one of the things I listened to was how the manager learned from mistakes and could they admit that they made mistakes and did they evolve their process? I was hiring their brain and their returns they could generate ultimately. So I, I hear that. I know that the, the, the scale of the client is important. And if it's 40% of your assets walk out the door if you don't satisfy the client. I would encourage you to have that conversation with the client and with data. I think what you'll find is clients want you to perform because that's why they hired you. So oh, I agree. I just feel like um, it, it's sometimes these changes when you have these conversations in hindsight, uh, that's the exact wrong time sometimes to be <laughs> thinking about these <laughs> things, right? It's the, it's the value managers or quality growth managers in late 90s owning, uh, you know, the, the high PE non-earners recent IPOs just because there's this implicit need to, to keep up. And so um, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's a balance, I guess, trying to be true to your discipline, true to your process, true to what you think adds alpha for a client um, and trying to and yet trying to evolve, like, you know, we talked about this digital age that we're in now and, and maybe how you need to apply, you know, think about adapting to that versus, versus the, the industrial age from 30 years ago, something along those lines. Fair points. All fair points. Jason, we're at the top of the hour. Should we let these good people escape us? We, we should. Uh, I would close with the following remarks. Um, Two weeks from now, we usually do this every other week. Two weeks from now is here in the US. We have foreign uh, dialers in, shall we say, is the Thanksgiving holiday here in the US. I don't think anybody in the US wants to hear from us on Thanksgiving, uh, at least uh, of all at the lunchtime hour. So the next one is going to be the 3rd of December. It's always noon Eastern. We have not decided the topic as of yet. If you have suggestions for topic, we would love to hear from you. Michael and I hear from a lot of you via email. Also tell us what you'd like to hear our opinions on. It could be basically anything. We have a pretty vast corpus and mandate when we work with clients in terms of the questions they ask us. So we've thought about a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't even featured yet on the podcast. We'd love to hear it. Or if you wanna hear more on something we've already talked about, that's cool too. Might I encourage you, tell your friends about us. Go subscribe at the YouTube, t YouTube page from the research chair. We'd love uh, for you to like view all those videos. Keep, keep the dialogue going. It's how we get better too. Thanks so much for joining us. Michael, any final remarks? Well, 
thank you to all of you who show your faces and smile at us. Uh, sometimes you don't know who you're speaking to when you can't see anybody. We hope that you enjoy our little chats and keep coming back. We're going to stay here and continue to do this. Bye, everyone.